I'm Fran Boyd, I'm the co-executive director of Positive Money, and we're hosting today with London Renters uh, Union, which is great, Beyond Building, fixing the UK housing crisis. I'll just give a brief intro, then I'm going to go to my speakers uh, for comments. We're going to have a bit of a roundtable conversation, and then we're going to open it up for comments and questions from the floor. Um, and we're hoping to finish in here by about 6.45. So no matter where we live or what we do for a living, we all want a place to call home. But for too long, the UK housing market has been designed to turn our homes into vehicles for accumulating wealth. The UK's housing crisis is reaching a critical point, with rent prices continuing to rise, whilst home ownership remains out of reach for many after years of house price growth outpacing wage growth. In the 12 months to February this year, the average cost of rent in the UK rose by 9%, which was the highest increase, uh, annual increase since records began in 2015. And this event comes off the back of significant weakening of the renters' reform bill over the last weeks, which has meant the renters' reform coalition are now unable to support the bill as it currently stands. Many organisations and MPs attending today have worked tirelessly on the bill in the aim of ending the no fault evictions that are leading a leading cause of homelessness. And this setback confirms how challenging but necessary a bold agenda for housing is. Housing can also offer an insight into understanding the complex intersecting challenges we face, including economic inequality, racial injustice, and the climate crisis. And whilst much policy discussion focuses on how to increase the building of new homes. Evidence suggests that to address the crisis, responses must extend beyond the sole focus on this. And the government's own model suggests that even large amounts of new supply is unlikely to make homes affordable by it itself. It's therefore important that strengthening the rights and protections for private renters and increasing our stock of social and community-led homes is prioritised. So today we're going to be exploring the challenges of the housing crisis and policy ideas that go beyond building. Oof, yeah. And just for in terms of housekeeping for everyone, we are going to be recording the presentations and the discussion, um, and we'll, a recording will be made available afterwards. Um, and just to be clear, we're going to be leaving here at seven, but we will continue the conversation beyond this uh, in the two chairmen. So I'd just like to welcome our excellent speakers. We have Siobhan Donaghy, the Campaigns Officer at London Renters Union, a grassroots tenants union representing more than 7,000 people across London. Alex Steiner is a senior researcher at the New Economics Foundation, focusing on housing policy. Denisha Kazi is the head of economics at Positive Money. And Sean Berry is a former member of the Greater London Authority and Green MP candidate, standing for Brighton Pavilion. Uh, so we'll we'll start with Siobhan, if that's okay. Yes, hi everyone. Um, oh, sorry, I just um, switched the metal. Um, yeah, I just want to start by saying that it's definitely not controversial to say that we are living through a full-scale housing emergency. And one of the key drivers of this is unaffordable high rents. There are eight and a half million households that are living in private rented accommodation in the UK, and many of these households should be living in secure social housing because of their health, their age, or caring responsibilities. But instead, they're trapped in an incredibly insecure and very, very expensive private rental sector. And for the millions of households privately renting, their rents have outpaced wage growth year on year. The housing benefit bill has also become completely and utterly unsustainable. And rents are only gonna keep growing. The Resolution Foundation predicts that rents are gonna to continue to outstrip wages for the coming years. And what does this mean in reality? What's the human cost of high rents? Well, it means that after paying rent each month, people are left, left with very, very little. For example, the healthcare assistant in London, after paying tax, um, is kind of spending 67% of their monthly wages on rent. 67%, that's crazy, that's a frontline worker. And people might say, well, it's actually a London problem, the rent's really out of control here. But actually across the UK, outside of London, rents have actually risen higher. Um, and in the kind of most deprived areas across the UK, rents have risen by 50% in the past 10 years, in areas where wages have seriously stagnated in comparison to the capital. And the impacts of, the impacts of high rents on people's lives is absolutely catastrophic. 
It has led to huge rises in economic rent-high convictions and homelessness. Last year, around one child in every classroom in London was homeless. That's about 83,000 children who are, going to home, who are going to school every day without home, and that is kind of, it's, it's criminal. High rents have also led to really dangerous levels of poverty, some of the highest levels in Europe, despite the fact that we're one of the most economically developed countries in the world. And poverty has lifelong impacts upon people's lives, and for many, it's completely irreversible. And there's also an economic cost to all of this as well, it's not just a human cost. An increasing amount of councils are going bankrupt or stripping back on essential social housing provision, um, essential service provision, because of the rapid levels of homelessness that they're experiencing. The number of households who are turning to the council for private temporary accommodation has nearly doubled. And because those landlords can charge whatever they want, councils are now spending 1.74 billion on temporary accommodation every year. But also basic economics shows us that the economy grows when people have increased spending power. But right now, millions of people can barely afford to heat their, their homes or do a food shop after they've paid their rent every month. The housing system is evidently not working for everyday people and the economy. And what we need is bold solutions that tackle the housing emergency at its core, not sticking plasters. And one of the key ways to do that is a massive expansion of public housing. However, this is going to take a really long time to start to have a material impact on people's everyday lives. And we should be seriously asking ourselves, what are the solutions we have in front of us right now that we can be implementing that can start to transform people's lives? and can also complement and work in partnership with other progressive housing policies. And one of those solutions that we should really be championing is exploring rent controls. We should be looking to explore rent controls that actually over time incrementally lower rents to more genuinely affordable levels. And in the immediate, start to stabilise the sector and give tenants greater security over their lives. Rent controls also don't cost the government anything. In fact, they could save the government millions and rent controls are the norm across Europe. In 16 countries, um, there are some form of rent controls, as well as having much stronger protections against exploitation and homelessness. And we have the highest rents and poorest housing quality in all of Europe because we don't have those protections. Rent controls were also the norm in this country from 1915 till 1988, and were also kind of advocated for both by Conservative politicians and Labour politicians and they were viewed as a necessary intervention to protect tenants. And the evidence shows that they worked, particularly done in tandem with huge expansions in public housing. During this period, people were spending much less each month on rent, and as a result, poverty levels were significantly lower. The dismantling of rent controls caused rents to leap from around 10% of renters' income to every month, to by the 1980s to 36% of renter income by the 1990s. And what we're seeing now is frontline key workers paying over 60% of their monthly incomes on rent. Poverty and housing security is a political choice. It's not just happened randomly. And we need to be bold and aspire to create policy that reverses the catastrophic impacts of the housing emergency on people's everyday lives, but also our broader economy. And rent controls are an essential part of this conversation. Thank you, so we'll now go to our, our host, uh, Louis Russell Moyle, MD, and then we'll come back to the panelists. Um, apologies for being late. We had um, folks on, and I was I had to hang around to novel Alicia Kearns because we're pushing through a trying to ban conversion therapies. Um, it, it's been an interesting day in Parliament. Of course, we've had a defection of um, of probably the most outspoken um, Conservative member in favour of rent controls um, over to the Labour Party. Natalie, I'm sure won't mind me saying she's extremely right wing on everything else. But on that, she is, uh, she is to the left of, of the Labour Party. And I think that is not unhelpful to be having people um, of all different views who believe that rent controls is the way forward. The reality is that we have a system of rent controls in this country, but they are toothless and they are weak and they don't work. So what we need is not to try and reinvent the wheel, but we need to try and actually make sure that they can be applied to outer tenancy rents as well as inner tenancy rents, that they can't be used just as ways to evict people, and that also we stop some of the um, rent uh, um, inflation that we see in bidding wars. But there's more that we need to do as well. 
In the height of council uh, house municipalisation, over 50% of council houses in London were not built, they were bought. London's great council housing expansion was through buying streets and existing housing stock uh, all over the capital. And the same probably needs to happen now. We need to, of course, build, but we need to be beyond just the building rectory. We need to talk about how we fix the housing market, how we make sure people live in permanent accommodation protected by their council rather than fighting with their council like they are at the moment when they're putting substandard accommodation all over the place and we see it up and down the country, particularly in emergency and temporary accommodation. We need to find a way that housing benefit is paid back to the councils and then to the individuals and savings on that housing benefit allow us to actually build houses and invest and give councils incentives. We need to change the model for councils, of course, to be able to uh, um, enforce standards uh, so that they aren't letting them go. And fundamentally, my view is that we need to shrink the private rented sector. And we need to stop this rhetoric about worrying that landlords will leave the private rented sector. We need to embrace that and say, fantastic. Because what we, the, the, the buildings are not going to disappear offshore. The individuals might, but the buildings won't. And the buildings will be reallocated to other forms of rent, i.e. council rent, or other forms of tenure, you know, shared, etc. Although there's probably shared ownership, I, I grant you. Actually, is what we want to encourage. And so it is a tenure problem as well as a housing unit problem. We have the same number of housing units now per head of population as we did in 1970. And in 1970, there wasn't the same crisis now. Now, we all bear in mind, of course, that people live differently nowadays. I'm not saying that it's just a housing a, a, a tenure issue, but that is part of the issue. And so I'm really pleased to be able to host this discussion where you can start thinking about those mechanisms that we need to talk about that is beyond just building, that is about thinking about our housing sector. And when a Labour government comes in, and I'm convinced it will happen eventually, you know, maybe not this time round, although we all hope and pray, I hope and pray every night, but when it does happen, because politics is like that, we need to be ready from the Labour Party to have taken your ideas uh, and to have really be able to embrace them. Some of them quickly, some of them requiring legislative uh, changes, but we need to be saying, what changes do we need to see? Because the market is not working, uh, people are homeless, but people are also living in substandard uh, accommodation. And we also need to provide a get-out for those that have foolishly invested in the housing market. You know, kind of, we need to find a way of those people who have, because the state has exited from social care, and so therefore want to invest in their little social care sludge fund in private rented accommodations, to say to them, no, we will find a way for you to invest your money in social good things, and we will take those properties, uh, uh, manage those properties for you. And we can do it, I think, in a win-win. We can find mechanisms that everyone benefits, um, apart from maybe the corporations. But you know, kind of ordinary people who might have invested in mom and pop rental houses, ordinary renters, and our communities. And if we do that, I think we truly can build something rather remarkable in um, uh, in this country. Because at the moment, housing is a disgrace, and it should be a pride. So it's really important for us to unpack that. Um, 
I'm just going to start with a quick kind of overview of what we mean by financialization of housing. I think that's helpful. Um, it's really a process that's been ongoing since the 1980s, um, rooted in the um, uh, right to buy uh, policies and financial deregulation that happened around that time, and it's been ongoing. Um, and it's really eroded our social housing sector as we know. Financial motives, markets, and institutions in shaping our housing system. And it has real implications, as other people have mentioned on the panel and many people talk about today, for housing affordability, accessibility, and um, uh, decent living um, spaces. Um, one of the two of the key features of financialization housing, probably not the only ones, but two key features are um, firstly, the sort of more pronounced boom and bust cycles in housing and also the, the rapid house price inflation we've seen really um, above um, income growth. And I think those will be familiar features for everyone in terms of our housing market. And um, the ratio of house price to incomes has really more than doubled from a stable period where it was around 3.5-4% up until the late 1990s and now it's more than doubled for the UK at around 8% and for London it's around 12%, um, in some parts of London well over 20% and those aren't just really rich parts of London as you might expect. So a lot of diversity there um, and just put simply I think other people have already said this means we treat housing very much in our society as a vehicle for investment and um, wealth generation and intuitively I think we all know this because we see housing as our pension pots, um, um, our sort of inheritance. It's um, something to leverage, an asset to leverage for further borrowing. So we see it all around us. And it's redefined our housing system as something that's precarious now and um, scarcity and something for private gain. So some, one of the implications of that is, as I mentioned, the two-tier housing system, which affects, I think, housing prices affects everyone in, and is beginning to touch everyone's lives. But, it's more acute for um, black, brown, and other racialized um, people and communities. Um, and last year, Positive Money looked at um, the 2021 census data, and you won't be surprised to find that we saw um, racial disparities in housing across almost every measure you can imagine. So housing wealth, housing ownership, tenor groups, um, housing costs, and um, accessibility and living conditions. Not surprising, perhaps. But we also saw this, um, we also looked at it over time, over the last three census, so since 2001, and it's worsened over time, and that is remarkable, and that really coincides with periods of deepening financialization. So we really need to unpack these two strands, um, from sort of taking shape in our housing set policy. Um, and I just want to give a bit of a snapshot of some of those disparities. So in terms of declining housing um, home ownership rates, this is something we've seen happen in a lot of financialised housing markets in cities and um, countries around the world. Um, what we found is this is largely in the UK driven by persistent and growing gaps in home ownership amongst um, particular racial um, um, ethnic minority groups, so black African, black Caribbean, Bangladeshi, Pakistani groups, amongst some others. Um, we also found remarkable stats on um, housing wealth. So we've seen for decades house price, rapid house price growth uninterrupted for a very long time until recently. And that means a lot of people um, have, um, have sort of unearned um, property wealth gains, quite large property wealth gains. and. Um, there are also people that have been completely excluded from that. So black Caribbean and black African groups have had zero um, property wealth, um, medium value of property wealth during that same period. It's the same for some other sort of groups. So 26,000 um, medium property wealth in Bangladeshi. And that compares to white and Indian um, ethnic minority groups who have over gained over 100,000 in medium property wealth. So some stark figures there, and as I said, it goes across housing costs. Um, the same sort of, same groups experience higher housing costs in, in the same um, tenor groups. So whether it's um, home ownership, renting, or social sector, they face higher housing costs, and we've seen housing costs skyrocketing. So they're facing that in a more acute, at a more acute level. 
and also living conditions. So um, I think just to round it up, I just want to say that I think it's really important we start to talk about putting racial justice at the heart of housing policy because it intersects so much with it. And um, alternatives to um, the privatised housing market where many groups are being locked out of that market, home ownership and private rental sector are really important, which is what this conversation is about today. Um, I also just want to make one final point, which is that while I've been talking about racial disparities for specific groups, I think those groups also teach us how to have a better housing market. And I think it's really important we look at the fact that a lot of um, people from black communities and um, other racialized communities have a long history of um, really successful social and community-led housing, creating communities and good living spaces. They often live in the same area for generations rather than thinking about generating wealth from their property and moving on. Um, and I think we can learn a lot from those communities as well. So I'm going to talk through the kind of findings that, that, we, um, that we established through that research. Um, caveat to all of this is that in many ways London is the worst place to do this in the country because of the extremely high house prices that we will be familiar with. But I think our work hopefully demonstrates the extent to which um, it can be part of the solution to rising homelessness in London rather than a silver bullet because it's certainly not that. Um, so I'll wrap it through very, very quickly. Um, the problem, which you'll all be familiar with, which is rapidly escalating homelessness across the country, but particularly in London. So we now have 17 households per 1,000 in London living in TA, which is almost nine times the rest of England average. Um, I think it was mentioned earlier that we've got over 80,000 young Londoners living in temporary accommodation. That's bigger than a parliamentary constituency of um, kids living in TA. Um, and 20% of those in TA in London have been in it for at least five years. Um, and you can see the extent to which London um, is kind of ramping, uh, homelessness in London is, is, is uh, outstripping uh, that across the rest of the country. Um, this is costing us all, um, taxpayers and as we, as we mentioned councils as well, because of rising housing benefit and temporary accommodation costs. Obviously when you've got rising volumes of homelessness, a lack of supply in which to place those homeless families, councils having to resort to often exorbitant, incredibly poor quality TA, um, temporary accommodation subsidy that councils receive has been frozen at 90% of local housing allowance rates uh, since 2011 and obviously since then, as we all know, rents have risen quite significantly and they've had to place more and more households in that TA. So we now have a situation whereby uh, homelessness in London is costing around about a billion pounds a year, um, of which 31%, uh, so just shy of a third, is borne by councils alone. And that's the, the, the red line, which has gone up quite sharply over the last couple of years. Um, so, what role can acquisitions play in this? Um, at the moment, as we all know, the macroeconomic conditions for building homes is not particularly helpful. Build costs um, in that green line, uh, material costs have gone up um, about two fifths over the last, uh, two, sorry, about two fifths more expensive now than they were. Um, three years ago, um, and also house prices, as we've discussed, and this is a London figure, as we said, the blue line, um, are falling. So that offers an opportunity for councils to take advantage of those stagnating, if not falling, house prices, and also take advantage of the fact that, as we've mentioned, some landlords are wanting to sell at the moment. Um, it also enables councils to act relatively expediently because buying a home is often much more quicker than acquiring the land, negotiating with the developer, building a home, etc. So it enables kind of um, councils to act very, very quickly. The kind of the caution to all of this, and again, particularly in respect of London, is that what you don't want to do is embark, I would say, on a kind of course of acquisitions that only serve to overheat, further overheat already overheated property markets, which London is one, of course by adding and injecting too much demand. Um, but the scale in which it has taken place in London um, uh, through the GLA's programme called the Right to Buy Back scheme, which had been in operation over the last few years, um, I don't think is on the scale whereby it would serve to overheat those um, uh, local markets because it's led to the purchase of around about 1,300 homes uh, between 2021 and 2023, um, divided accordingly across those local authorities there, so that's about half of London's local authorities. And generally speaking, the split, um, the way in which those councils bought those homes were about 
give or take about half of it was for general needs, social rent, and the remaining half was for uh, temporary accommodation. Uh, one thing we did find in our research was that, um, uh, broadly speaking again, um, the acquisitions that took place were able to buy the type of homes that those councils needed more than new build properties tend to. Um, that's indicated by the kind of proximity of the dot, the red dot, to the, 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 um, the average there in columns the new build. Um, but you still see that in terms of three bed and four bed, which are often um, obviously mostly sought after by families, um, it was still very, very difficult to, for councils to buy those homes, notwithstanding the 100k grant that they would have received from uh, the GLA for general needs and the 65k grant they would have received for a TA home. And that's because, frankly, that grant funding just did not stretch far enough um, and because property prices are, are so high in London. Um, this, uh, I didn't do this, uh, my colleague Sam did it. Uh, I, it's a bit of a masterpiece, I think, on his part. Um, this is um, a cost-benefit analysis of the programme, uh, sorry, of what the programme that the Mayor of London has rolled out over the next 10 years, which is called the Council Housing Acquisitions Programme. Um, I will very, very, very briefly talk through what it means. Um, essentially what it means is that in terms of reducing housing benefit expenditure, temporary accommodation expenditure, um, and also generating indirect savings by improving the quality of housing, so reducing NHS costs, and by bringing people out of homelessness, you improve their economic productivity and their um, access to the labour market, therefore increasing tax revenues. You will save around about 2.3 billion, you being taxpayers and councils, will save about 2.3 billion pounds by the acquisition of 10,000 homes in London over the next 20 years it will take. Um, the annual savings start outweighing the cost at around about year 16, which is here, um, and by year 25 it's paid for itself and thereafter produce, produces a pure dividend to taxpayers. So um, I don't really have time to talk about the recommendations that arise from that, but maybe we can discuss that shortly. Okay, um, so I'm Sharp Perry um, until yesterday, I was a London Assembly member, um, I'm hoping to be um, an MP, um, and I'm here to talk about some of the work I've been doing as an Assembly member on what I call buy the supply, um, but it is essentially the, the Council Homes Acquisition Programme, which people start to call CHAP, which I hate a lot. Um, it, needs, it needs a better name. Um, if anyone can think of one, that would be great. Um, but this work started um, a while ago now with asking some of the right questions in the Budget and Performance Committee in the London Assembly at the end of 2020 and that question was what's left in your devolved housing grant fund um, and the Met accidentally told us um, it wasn't really supposed to um, so we were aware that there was about 500 million pounds that was unallocated and unspent out of a billions grant program that you had um, that enabled us as a green group on the Assembly to put forward a budget amendment that did a bit like what I've just shown you. Um, purchased homes um, using 400 million of that money, actually doing it for intermediate London living rent. We have a, we have a well defined living rent um, level in London for simplicity, although you could adjust things either way. Um, and working out that that made enough of a surplus that enables you to create a, a rolling fund and borrow more and keep adding to the supply. Now this relied on the GLA becoming a landlord and it was it was a quite a theoretical budget amendment but it did seem to have an influence on the mayor because he subsequently used some of that unspent money to set up the right to buy back fund which is what Alex has evaluated and Alex is right that I did push the mayor to do some evaluation of this because it's a lovely idea but we need to be rigorous if we're going to turn this into national policy. Um, and that's kind of what I want to talk about because obviously there's, there's the London housing market where now private renting is the, the top tenure and that used to be social housing and that switch of tenure from social housing to private rented housing you could look at as a policy maker and just say well that's obviously going to do, be doing some harm in the country all the things that Siobhan was talking about, the problems that private renters face, the fact that affects the wider economy, their health, their education, there's all kinds of other things that does harm to. You could just say, look, we need policies that aim to switch that tenure back. But we do need to get policies through the Treasury. And Lloyd, you're completely right to say we need to be calling out for this. But we also need to prove that it's good value. Um, and I, I think we, we do need to do 
further work on this. Um, there's an awful lot of evidence in the, the schmars, these are the social, these are the sorry, strategic housing market assessments that councils and anyone producing a local plan has to do to work out the level of housing need. Um, and what that produces in the end is a, num a big number that says, and the, for example, the last one for London produced a need for annual new homes of 65,000. And it sort of defined what kinds of tenures were needed. It, it basically said we needed mostly social housing to be built. Um, and you can then try and put in place policies to fulfill that need. But, but honestly, that is a net figure. That is a net figure that comes out of looking at an awful lot of different stuff. And if you delve down into the methodology of these schmars in different areas, and like I say, I've looked at it in detail for London, you can see that, that within that, there is what's called backlog, backlog need that relates to people being in tenures that they can't afford, being in overcrowded homes, so you've got multi-generational households that don't really want to be where there's children who could do with having their own home. There's all kinds of backlog need there that is, that is taken into account and then there's assumptions made that this backlog of need will be cleared over 25 years. And it isn't just overcrowding, um, it is also people living in homes which don't have the facilities they need, who have different kinds of disabilities. It's also people living in homes that don't have basic decent <coughs> home standards. Um, all of this, this need, you can see within the calculations that there is a standalone need for tenure to switch. That comes, you get this net figure at the end of people in the housing lobbying um, sort of universe are often just talking about adding new homes. These, no, these homes need to be built. But there's a standalone need right there in the calculations that says shifting tenure will help. And within that, Alex was talking about being able to buy bigger homes than the ones you can build because the economics of building a large home, particularly in London, are impossible for housing associations and councils to manage um, for social rent. They're just impossible. Um, within that, those calculations, there's also a really clear need for there to be larger homes, particularly in social housing tenures. And council home acquisition from the private market deals with all of that, particularly if you're adding in um, improvements to the facilities to, to make them decent homes, to make them more energy efficient, to make them more adapted for, for people's disabilities, um, and, and absolutely does save money in its own right. The, the analysis that, that NEF did, which I'm really proud I got the mayor to do, is, is very top line and more and about money and not about the wider benefits. So we'll, we'll save the money in benefits and we'll save the money straight away, pretty much. 16 years is a, you know, that's a very, very decent payback time um, for doing all of this, particularly at social rents and particularly when you can get different numbers if you're doing intermediate and living rent as well. Um, but then you also get the wider benefits, the benefits to health, the benefits to well-being, the benefits to education. None of that has been evaluated. But I come out of transport campaigning, that's what I was before I was elected. And if you're building a road, <laughs> you get to count all kinds of things um, in your cost-benefit analysis. Um, and it just isn't that rigorously set out for housing yet. And I genuinely think there's a huge opportunity here. It seems like common sense. It is being worked out by councils um, already. It is being done by councils because they can just see the common sense of it when they've got the money available. But there's a huge opportunity for there to be a separate investment fund provided by government that isn't just the housing grants that get given for building now, but is a separate fund for acquisitions. These things do separate things in the market, you do need to look at them separately. Um, but I want to see an evaluation done which looks at these wider benefits and then also compares this with, and I don't mean in opposition to, I mean with a view to doing it in addition to new building. Because I think the key thing here is speed. It absolutely is speed, as well as the size thing I mentioned earlier on. Those two things alone will show that it's, it's as good as building in terms of the alleviating need, but then it also has these additional benefits of coming through much, much more quickly. Um, and like I say, there is, like in, in, the, in the calculations that go towards a local plan that produce these numbers that are all about housing needing to be built, 
there's, all, there's this need for there to be policies that shift the tenure, and yet actually no council has that. The government certainly doesn't have that, but the next government could. And I think if we do this work now, looking at um, the ability to do this and comparing it to and with new build, we can make a bang up case for billions of investment to go into this. And I know that there'll be lots of questions in the round table about like, how does this the market and what if we do it so much. There are answers to all of this and it is something that I think when we start to look at it properly will seem so obvious that we will absolutely want to do it. But we're going to need to put the case forward to the Treasury and I think the next stage we need to do in the next months is get together as a, as a group of people who care about this kind of thing um, and genuinely put together that economic case and make it as obvious for investment as road building because I'm so I was when I was a revenue campaigner I was so sick of every time there was a budget coming up um, the, the the Chancellor wanting to say they're investing and the Treasury numbers only churning out when you should build roads and it should be churning out when you should be buying houses that's what I think <laughs>
you know, if you were to do an acquisition process, process on its own, that could be, that could lead to an overheated market. If you could just uh, introduce rent controls on their own um, and, and strengthen protections for renters, that could lead to a sucking of demand out of the housing market, which could also bring its own problems. And that's why it's so fantastic to be talking about these uh, a suite of policies. Those are not the only policies you want, but we need to be talking about a suite of policies. Um, so I think it's exciting. I think that um, it doesn't really make sense to be sort of ideologically for or against uh, rent controls, personally. I think that you can design them really badly, and you can design them really well. You can design them crudely, and you can design them really sophisticatedly. Um, but we know, like, it's really critical. We want to see a shrinking of the private rental sector, and it's really critical that we do that in a managed way, and it's not a chaotic way. It's a managed process. Um, and there's, there's, you know, there's work being done now. I'm doing research, which I hope can help um, with the design of the process, but there's also other countries that we can look at for both mistakes and successes um, in terms of this process. So, um, yeah, so I kind of just wanted to say that as a ramble. Switch, shrink, shift. Great. <laughs> we, what happened in the, in, the, in the gap in between those things is that the private rental sector grew by twice, you know, doubled in size, and the social housing sector halved. We're down from 34% to 17%. So we halved the one we really wanted, and we doubled the one that's more expensive and less secure. And we've got to get that rebalancing back again now. It's great. I think. New Economics Foundation, terrific stuff. R really getting getting this message across and showing how, because temporary accommodation has cost us an absolute fortune. You get your money back pretty quickly if you buy the property and use it for TA. To start with, I mean, in a few years' time, you've still got it. It's still in the social sector forever. It's acquired. It's, it's there. So it helps the long term as well as the short. 
short term, but it, it fixes a short term problem as well. It doesn't ignore the fact we've got to build our way out of the problem as well, because we haven't got enough to go around. And it's no good just simply shift, shifting and shrinking the, the, the debt. We've also got to start the process that we should have started 30 years ago of building our way out. Uh, we would have 4.3 million more properties in the UK than we have at the moment if we had the European average house bill over the last 30 years. So we, we've got a bit of a 4.3 million catch up to do, and we'd better start now.
kind of shield themselves from actually providing like adequate welfare provisions, pensions, and they kind of transfer that risk onto individuals and use kind of housing as a way to kind of generate wealth or assets to kind of protect themselves. So we need to kind of decouple that a little bit and make sure that any kind of interventions in housing are also putting those protections in place for people. Um, so I think that's really important. I think within that as well, like the landlord is quite a broad category. It's not it's, it's not kind of a really fixed term. It kind of crosses lots of class boundaries as well. It's not just really rich people that are protected in housing. And but what I think a lot of people have done is like they've gambled on the housing market to get like rich quick. And that was one of the biggest problems kind of driving the housing emergency as well because they're expecting massive returns and that's something that doesn't need to be tackled alongside of like actually putting great protections in place for the people in society. I think I just wanted to like um, also answer the question on like supply because this is the biggest thing that comes up when, whenever we talk about like bringing in great regulations in the private rental sector. The big pushback is well, we're seeing a mass exodus of landlords leaving the market, and like basically the, the evidence doesn't back that up. Um, there's a report that came out from the Social Market Foundation recently, which is in no way a really left leaning left leaning kind of like think tank or anything like centre at all. And they did a kind of mapping of rent controls kind of across Europe, <coughs> countries, and found that it didn't actually impact supply. Um, and yeah, so it's kind of important to like look at those kind of things. Um, and when, when I say supply, I'm saying supply of housing. I think there's a question that came up is like, we're, we're thinking about tenants here, are people moving in because of tenants that are actually suitable for them to live in. And that's why, like, as people have been saying, like, a lot of these policies are in isolation, they're in unison. Because if, we're, if landlords are leaving the market, because it's, it's, it's less profitable to put up for them, essentially, but those those houses that move on to social housing, or like social rent, or like, yeah, it's kind of more suitable housing, that's a good thing, it's not a bad thing, and that's why we need to do these policies kind of together. many policies we've heard about and options we've heard about in the short term is that even you know there's appetite and awareness but all different kinds of policies to help get the pressure up um, whether it's around second homes or um, uh, the buy to let market so sort of delivering on the right approach I think is really important and and also around the sort of um, financial other aspects the sort of speculative taking this thing out this sort of speculative part of the market I think local authorities are also kind of involved in that in some way, sort of trying to unpack that sort of pressure on local authorities to sell up housing. And, you know, um, that also needs to be addressed if you're going to have options where they don't have to put up and sell their assets, but bring them into social um, um, housing instead. I think that that also needs to be addressed. Um, and the tax, the tax system being important in all of this, I mean, we talk about in our sort of people owning that tax system, it's been a lot of sort of gains in property wealth that have been concentrated um, amongst certain groups. So I think each of those impacts are really important. Michelle. Yeah, I mean, thanks for all really, really good points. I think that is, that is a key point, that this comes in a suite of things. That your, your goal that I talked about of having the tenureship, you can have lots of different policies that, that push towards that. And in some of the markets, like that we've gone short term less, that's, that's a genuine problem in London, it's a problem in Brighton as well. Um, having restrictions and rent controls, more rights for renters, that might lead to a population of what I call distressed landlords, <laughs> who then need a soft landing, and that's part of that. But I absolutely take your point, Tom, that, that kind of, there's, there's, a, there's a tension with admitting that there might be some distressed landlords, and trying to reassure people that the legislation that's about to go through is not going to do that. I think you're right, the legislation that's about to go through is nowhere near enough to, to create that. But some of the things we might want to do are, and I think that ought to be our goal, we ought to be trying to push landlords out, but also giving them a, a soft landing. Um, there's other points, and a lot of people like to talk about this um, in terms of empty homes, um, because it's the easier thing to talk about than shifting tenures when you've got city tenants. 
Um, I think there are, there's some really interesting stuff in the Legends Times and London report that suggests part of the rise in the number of empty homes is to do with things like problem getting, getting homes to dispose when people die. Um, now there's definitely stuff you could do with the, the system of taxes and offering people incentives to give first dibs if you've inherited a home to, to, the, to the government. There's definitely a way that you could think about trying to incentivize sales there. So I think there's, there's a lot of creativity that you can go through to, to try and create a, a genuine strategy that takes in a lot of these little things on the edges that are all contributing to pressure on the housing market. And I just want to say a couple more things. One is the 1970s housing acquisition boom. Um, the, the, the ward I used to represent in Highgate had a really big set of mansion blocks that we bought. And I still had a resident, one of my constituents, was, was the councillor who'd done that. Um, and he's bought like 300, what are now one million pound flats each, if they've gone into right to buy. Um, on the edge of housing for three, for three million pounds in the 1970s. <laughs> Off a really bad landlord who was not in the room. But those are, there's, there's a huge legacy of homes like that all across the country. And we absolutely need to get back there. And the final thing I wanted to say was, I, when I spoke originally, I was speaking about the Shema and the fact that, that you've got this overall net need that comes out. Um, and, then, and I didn't want to imply that we didn't have that need. Um, and I wanted to talk about the scale of need. So the difference between the original net need and the, the net need when you include all the different <coughs> retainers you've got is about 10,000 out of the 65,000. So the difference we can make with this is, is some, but it does not completely in any way or, or even that significant we were painting to build, but it is very significant in terms of changing the lives of the people whose home you switch to in it. And that is a big component of the housing needs that don't get sorted out when it comes to those numbers. So I don't know if I would say that. It's 10k out of 65k would be the get me. So if we have a scheme where we say to landlords, convert your property into government gilts and we will take the ownership of that property, government gilts have a slightly less uh, generous return in the property because of the property boom, but you're effectively giving someone 24 to 28% extra on their gain there. Um, uh, it's a transfer of property, effectively, directly to um, to the uh, local authority. You will find, I bet you, hundreds and thousands of landlords that would take that up. If you particularly offered it on a limited time period, so you say in the next three years, if you transfer your property to, we, we will give you government gilts to be equivalent. You maybe say that it has to be a 10 year gilt that you take out minimum. In those 10 years, the council <coughs> will have gained almost the value of the property in rents uh, during that period and they will be able to pay the gilt off. It will cost the exchequer almost nothing because the capital gains is a theoretical, it's the only way it's liquidated anyway. It will save us money on numerous other social factors. There are financial mechanisms to make this work, and that's just one example for example. There are financial mechanisms that you can make it work, you can make the transfer property and you, everyone wins. But I do think we need to also understand that some of the mechanisms the government has pulled in the past have not worked. Stamp duty tinkering around generally has not worked. Giving stamp duty discounts to first time buyers has inflated the market and hasn't actually helped any first time buyer really overall, but it's actually made the market worse. So, yes, you can give, again, stamp duty incentives maybe if you're giving it, uh, selling property to a housing association. Maybe you can then say, uh, there's some gains, for example, there. But really, stamp duty changes haven't worked in that sense. And then I would say on um, the housing stressors, I really like that. And I think you could then roll a number of, you, know, you mentioned um, a, a rent, a, a, a right to buy, but you could include, for example, to say in housing stress zones, local mayors are allowed to introduce uh, um, proper um, rent regulation and in non-housing stress zones you have a weaker set of regulations. So you could have different stress regulations in different 
that, that I think that is possible. Um, but I think from a, a labor point of view, that is harder um, because you're talking about intervening in the market, whereas it's much easier to talk about financial mechanisms to swap tenure around. Does that make sense? And I, I do think that if there are people that can work up some of those mechanisms, you know, I've just done the, I did this afternoon, I think some of you all earlier on, about the, 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 the guilt and the bonds thing. But you know, kind of, if we actually have some people working that up, I actually think that you've got quite a soft landing with Treasury teams to be able to Thanks, Tony. Um, I want to open it up to the wider
and I, I'm just going to focus on one of them. Um, so a few people were kind of talking about like media and, and questions around that. And I think it's pretty clear that like the kind of dominant narrative of like how we get our power from crisis is that we can like build our way out of it. And often that is kind of said as like we don't need to build housing and with less kind of emphasis on like the end of the fight for like the affordability and the perceived problem. And like people were saying in the audience, like people are there ready to build the type of housing that we need, but we're not like a grant funding available for it. Where it looks like a channel to kind of support those like smaller developers or like community land trusts to kind of build that housing. And kind of what's happening in the absence of that, which is actually very scary, is that the homes that are being built are often very unaffordable. Um, like by developers, by builders, because a lot of the, because like their funding models are based on quick returns and the highest returns possible. So what they want is the highest rent possible. So they're building a lot of luxury and unaffordable apartments, and like particularly in London, a lot of that is happening in like some of the most prime boroughs, like of the city. And what that does in turn is pushes up rents in those areas because it kind of creates higher market rent levels, and that's having a negative impact on housing market in those areas and there's like there's not like planning legislation is designed to kind of infill loopholes to allow them to circumvent any restrictions based on like what they're building like it's very easy for like a developer uh, to kind of use grants and liability to kind of make it out that basically they can kind of circumvent like the affordable housing quota and also affordable housing is also kind of deemed to be 80 percent of market rent which is a slight kind of decrease, like minimal decrease on like what's affordable, but that's actually not affordable. Um, I think for me to be honest, the word affordable has become so kind of like broad and like opaque that it doesn't, for me when I hear it, I don't actually hear affordable. Um, like what we should be hearing is like social rent and kind of like redefining those kind of terms. What's, what's even happening for the GLA is like putting those kind of definitions of like what's generally affordable. And I think we really need to start investing in social housing on people that are like building right now and not building the housing that lots of people need. Um, it's a question for you all. 
my method of thinking is analogy. And one analogy that I have is that um, this is very similar to the debate that happened in the UK over transatlantic slavery hundreds of years ago because of the abolition of it and how long it took in order to get to that point and how much they had to um, give to the people that were benefiting from the enslavement of people like myself. Um, and currently what we're looking at right now, to me, is very, very similar to that in terms of there's been many years of talking about changing the system, and yet it has not changed. And we're now talking about having to have a soft landing for landlords. What about people, children, who are homeless right now? When do they get their opportunity to actually have a safe, affordable, decent home to live in, whereby they can actually excel at school because they, they, are, they are in a secure household. They're not in a secure position. When do we start talking about those sorts of things as opposed to those that are already exploiting wealth through the fact that they are the ones that are benefiting? Hi, my name is Ailey. I am the editor of Canada Living Rights, which is Colton Turner's being, and I also coordinate the National Campaign for Rent Controls, um, which has been successful because the Scottish Government has actually introduced rent control at stage one. But we've spoken a lot about supply, and I think that's obviously incredibly helpful, but I'd like to have both a comment and a question about rent controls. So Scotland introduced the rent freeze, which is a very blunt instrument of um, four to zero percent cap on all tenancies, and then that was increased to three percent. And I think it provided a really good exercise for those who exist in the housing sector as you know, an activity of myth busting because um, through that rent cap and rent freeze, PR, the PRS at Scott, in Scotland increased by 3,000. Um, and so I guess when landlords are talking about supply, what they're actually talking about is the supply of private landlordism. Um, so I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned from Scotland in that regard. But that being said, what the Scottish Government did wasn't perfect. Um, we saw that through joint tenancies, landlords used that as an opportunity to increase the rent. Actually, when from Edinburgh increased by 18% in one year. So living rent is always demanded for rent controls, which are point-based and include things like the energy efficiency of the home and the quality of the home. And I think I would like you know, to put it to yourselves as to what rent controls could actually look like. Because we see this media narrative that's often <coughs> it's used all the time, you know, by the, our opponents that rent controls don't work. And what they're actually talking about is that fresh generation of rent controls that was in, um, introduced during the interwar period that was very blunt. So yeah, my question to you is, what should rent controls actually look like, and what should we achieve through them alongside just increasing, oh sorry, decreasing rents and improving things for tenants? Thank you. Are there any more final questions? I'm not a policy person by the way, so it's been really interesting hearing lots of very technical and ingenious solutions to various bits of the housing crisis. Um, maybe just to sum up, I'd like to invite a sort of wider question to go away from this. If the panelists, the people in the round table, didn't have to worry about appeasing the London lobby, appeasing the editors of the Daily Mail, or like the Bank of England. If in that heart of hearts they could implement one policy that would do as much good for the housing crisis to solve it as possible to like do it very connected, what would they be? Yeah, thank you. Okay, one more hand. Um, very, very quickly, we've talked a lot about the private rented sector and sort of shifting tenure, etc. And um, our experience is also in the social sector, in the council sector, actually increasingly people are struggling with rents. Um, there is an increasing, uh, like, loophole increases through tax search fees and service charges. So people are seeing 16% increases in rent in social housing. So again, in the wide measure of like wide policies and wide measures to adopt, what do you think can be also done in social housing, in council housing, so 
that to be quality housing and for that to be affordable, genuinely affordable housing. Thank you. Um, are there any more questions or comments from the other panelists? Yeah. yeah um, <coughs> Associations and housing associations are big developers and they're not in touch 
local people has been a disaster. And I think we should re-evaluate who owns that property. And we should be saying those properties are owned in trust by the developer, by the housing association. And if the residents want to enfranchise themselves and appoint a new housing association or the council to own them, uh, run them, that's what should happen. And that would drive the quality of social housing up. Because housing, social housing landlords would know if they offer bad quality social housing, the people who live in it would have a ballot and decide to move to someone else. And it's not their asset to do what they want, it's them doing it on behalf of other people. So I think there are other things, not just, we've talked about private sector, but I think there are other things we can do in the social sector that totally changes the power dynamic um, that we see at the moment where people are giving value. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna run through the final comments. I'll start with the Alex, and then we'll hear from Sam. Sure, um, so my um, green policy, um, I don't think it's actually that much of a dream, I think it is doable, I hope, um, with the right ambition, um, political will, and making sure that all local governments, the mechanisms of both central and local government have access to their data for evaluation. So we can do with the body, or scale up to the point whereby we are able to do with the body of um, social housing, full social strength, um, over the course of the next decade, not just this fiscal year. Um, unfortunately, I don't know if that's a missing opportunity to come out of the but um, getting to the point whereby we're doing that and then sustaining that. Um, in relation to the gentleman in this panel at the back, um, he talked about homeless children. I think you're absolutely right. And, and, and uh, once we get urgency, we can fix the pace. And you know, it, a few of the panelists have other, other dimensions. There are, there, there are so many different types of housing crisis, or crises that go to form what is an overall completely dysfunctional system. Not many people have benefited. I would argue those who are suffering the most adversely are those in temporary accommodation for homeless and specifically those you know, who are children because their life and chances are um, damaged in ways that are so significant and profound and long lasting. Um, for those of you who haven't had the chance to listen to the uh, news agency podcast on that subject, which I think last week or the week before, it is um, harrowingly listening about the extent to which a child's Living in temporary accommodation has a long lasting life prospect. Like one school that seems to have been landed to say it. Fifty uh, percent of that of, of the teachers we interview um, whose kids are in temporary accommodation. That is a national scandal. It's something which I don't think is particularly prominent in public consciousness. As far as it's particularly, I don't think people apart from us, I don't think people think of home as as a treatment. As, um, there is a real debate there to be won, and I think if we can try to get that particular issue all the housing crises that we face, um, percolate that somehow, um, then I think we might start getting somewhere in addressing what I think and we can start trying to do for the most important part of the issue of temporary accommodation. Sure. Um, yeah, I just want to summarise my efforts got to the last contributions there that I'd like to um, yeah, kind of provide to. I think I'm going to like end with like green housing policy being housing scenario just like the back of the <laughs> question. Um, I thought I'd yeah start really with like um, the point kind of raised about like the kind of attitude people get about social housing and kind of like as you touched on like social housing tenants are experiencing like massive rises in service charges that actually aren't fully covered by housing benefits well so people have to be paid out of their pocket uh, which is kind of fairly like impoverishing people. I think what we don't talk about often is that obviously people living in social housing are kind of allocated that social housing because they're on lower incomes and they're kind of more at risk in kind of other kind of like factors. So their relationship to like the wage that they're paying on their rent is actually quite tight. So when social rents are increased, they're actually more likely to be affected and impacted. And the poverty levels that people experience living in social housing, despite having a secure tenure, is much higher. Like one in four people living in social housing is living in poverty right now. So like we really need to tap into those questions and think about like the impact on the service charge type that happening. And yeah, thanks for the question on what, what rent controls should look like. And yeah, we kind of looked at living rent um, in a lot of like development of like our campaigning on rent controls. And I think it's a really key question because rent 
their controls and their watching their controls because a lot of them are really ineffective. Um, so just talking about like bringing back controls doesn't necessarily mean massive transformations to our housing. So it's being really precise about what we want our like, controls to achieve and kind of carving that out in the debates that we're having about the policy. And I think like in the rent union, we want to see rent controls to actually lower rents, not like rent stabilisation, like kind of like increase the security. We need to be tackling the rents that are just completely and utterly out of control and we're not going to stick to housing prices and actually tackle that. And it's, be, it's being a managed process of that, like not overnight just kind of plopping rent and kind of gradually lowering them in, in a way that is like, yeah, it's, it's safe and, and possible. And yeah, just to kind of end on the ideal um, policy, I mean, I'm just going to say what we think in the rent union, and I think it kind of speaks to uh, what we're going to say in the back, because like, it's quite difficult to like hone down what we want or like make uh, policies accountable to like politicians when the, the desperation people are feeling is, is horrific right now. And I, I really share that sentiment that like it, it's, it's difficult to make things palatable. And I think as a rent seeking union, we try to collectively imagine what our housing could look like. I mean, I'm 32, I don't think I'm gonna win the housing that like, we need and that I want but before I die. But I sure am gonna put a lot of effort into trying to win it for future generations. And what we think of a rent union is to move towards a housing based on profit, it's based on actual need, on, on people need the right to a home, which is essential to human life. And that's kind of moving towards a democratic based public green kind of housing system uh, that's kind of run on need and not on profit. And I think that's what we should be aspiring to and transitioning towards. We're not going to get it straight away, but that's what we should have in our minds. Because if we don't have what that is, if we don't imagine collectively together, then we can just build each other bricks and not fight for a housing that we want. Carbon, the, the comparison between building and buying in terms of the carbon impact, 
really important to talk about. Um, so um, the writing job model that we want, I think we're going to have to all get the pub now and talk about that. Thank you, Sean. That's a great segue. Um, yeah, just to wrap up, thank you all for, uh, for coming and, and um, contributing to the conversation. It's been rich and very uh, varied uh, from the need to move away from profit, uh, new homes to live in, not assets to own, talking about the rights framework, the urgency of this crisis, um, how it is an emergency. Uh, Richard's words, I like shift, strengthen, switch. Uh, rent controls, acquisition, the need for 